Gabe. I think we can start. Um, hi, my name is Anatoly, and uh, I'd like to take you all on the journey to manage closure uh, external resource state with a tiny library called Mount. And uh, I think we can switch the slide now. Let me. Um, okay, but before before talking about Mount, I just like to thank um, two companies uh, in no particular order. Um, first, I, let's let's I'd like to thank Homegrown Labs um, for this awesome conference. I mean, this has been nothing but great conference, and I'm I'm learning a lot, and the talks are great. Um, and the second company I'd like to um, thank is Chaired Solutions, as that allows me to do full time closure, uh, which uh, which is really unique in uh, at least in the Philadelphia tech scene, uh, which is small consultancy out of Philadelphia who've, that does closure, Scala, Java, big data, mobile, and whatnot. So with that, uh, let's jump in directly into Mount. The first thing I'd like to introduce you is two different worlds that I get to live in when I develop software. So the world on the left is, uh, is a production world, right? It's where everything is well organized, the the black and green world on the, on the left. Everything everything needs to work, not just work, but work is designed. Um, everything needs to be solid. There is no room for error there, right? The world on the right, though, is uh, a little different. It's the world of development. It's where I create things. It's where I push the limits. I always question the impossible. I'd like to break things and create them again and to break and create them again. So it's my little creativity world. And uh, those two are really, uh, they really don't talk too much. And uh, the, way, the way I usually make them talk is I package my creations in these little boxes and I ship them uh, via my friendly whale into the production. And the, the other uh, thing that we can do since we're powerful closure developers will usually have network REPL running on the in on our in our on our servers and we can just connect to uh, any system and reload that matrix but uh, having to those to having to, to these, these two worlds uh, they, they're very different in nature right so the world the production world is is the world that needs to be as secure as possible usually it's something that we need to definitely rely on it needs to react to business needs and so forth. Um, the world uh, on the right, uh, the, the development world is a little different. I mean, while they both work and uh, has to do with the same product, the development world is a little different. It needs to be as open as possible for me. It needs to react to my needs. I need to explore and hack on it. Um, and I like to jump in into the problems that I usually have in the development world. Um, so the, and the problems that impact the development flow. Uh, so the first thing is a REPL launch time, and uh, this has been uh, this has been a frequent kind of problem that people talk about in the closure community. And this particular metrics, this stats is are not new; they're from 2014, but uh, not nothing really changed since then. A little, a little improvements, but uh, if we talk about the REPLs, if we talk how fast that is, to, how fast it takes to to start the REPL. Uh, it still takes seconds, five to six seconds, just for a new project with no dependencies besides Clojure itself. We can start uh, Clojure itself pretty quickly without network REPL, without anything, without the class path, which is one second. We can, of course, export the class path from Lanagen or Boot and start Clojure with that exported class path. But uh, it still uh, impacts development uh, flow because any anytime you add a dependency, you have to go back to Lanagen or Boot and uh, export that class path again. So it is a problem. We have a very different story in closure script world, of course, because something like Plank, which is a uh, which is a great closure script REPL, and if you guys haven't used it, I've, I really highly recommend to try it out. That that guy starts in, in no time, twenty something milliseconds. And uh, usually, if I want to try something that's not closure specific, I always start it and try something in it first. The second problem I'd like to uh, introduce is a uh, is a namespace recompilation. So say we have um, we have a database connection, right? That's 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 in disconnected state, and we apply function to it, and it becomes connected. So later we uh, decided that this particular namespace, this this, this database connection eleven, uh, 
uh, has a has some problem or we would like to add something to it we add it and we rec recompile that namespace say our database connection is an atom is an atom after we recompile the namespace or reload it in in the REPL, it's a very very good chance that uh, that the connected value of uh, of the previous database connection is still there right so it's it's pretty much stale at this point uh, so this is a problem right, that, that, that impacts the development flow. Another problem, of course, is the mutability of external resources, right? We know that uh, our database connections close, or we can sometimes we use database that's used by other applications or people. We often try to, of course, not do that and limit ourselves by schemas and transactions and uh, our own test databases. But sometimes we do have to work on the databases that do not have transactions or, or they just use this as uh, they just a big messy cluster that everybody uses so the data can certainly disappear uh, when we depend on it right so sockets connections close they time out files get moved and threat pool workers die get a live lock deadlock this is not something that we actually control and it gets a little out of control right so it's a little frustrating if we have no control over it and uh, of course it impacts our development flow um, so now I, from going from that problem, so I'd like to present to you a couple of ideas. Those are not my ideas. They're just, just, uh, you know, the historical software development ideas that may help us solving these problems. The first one would be, would be to decouple resources from the application logic. So it's often that we see that I see the code that actually deals with the resources within the application logic itself, within the code that does business logic and nothing else. And that this creates creates problem that creates unnecessary coupling. So the first idea would be to minimize the code that has access to the resource and uh, by keeping those resources external to the application. So in this example, for example, you can see that uh, this is an example of a clean architecture by Uncle Bob that uh, that is quite nicely layered. So you have this external layer, the layer in gray blue that has devices, databases, external interfaces. That's where the external resources uh, are, are better, uh, are better tamed, right? That, that's that, that's the best place that I find uh, we should uh, deal with our business resources, and we should never have. Uh, we should try not to have external resources within the business logic. We should reject that seduction of uh, you know accessing that database or creating that or have a handle on that socket on the TCP/IP socket within the business logic. Um, the, another idea would be. To add some life cycle to states and we can do that um, so for example if we have the database connection that went um, stale it would be nice if we had a control over that we can start it and stop it before we recompile that namespace right at this point this is, these are just the idea this is these are just ideas um, and uh, overall I like my code as clay right I like to create things I like to break things create them again break them again uh, at the end, uh, this this process of breaking things and creating and recreating them, it ends up being uh, systems that uh, that ends up after after the way of building it this way uh, end up to be a lot more robust and a lot more resilient because they went through a lot of breakage breakage already and redesign. And I also noticed that being uh, the systems get to be a lot closer to the requirements as well. As a nice side effect, and I'd like to show you how how I do it with mount. So let's let's jump right in. First thing first, we need to uh, we need to tame that state, right? So here you can see uh, certain things that you might find familiar, right? You see you know, Hadoop, Redis, RabbitMQ, Mutant, and, and so forth. Those are those are different external resources, right? And uh, in, in Mount, we call it for what are, for, for what they are. We call them state, and we define that state, right? We say dev state, and we give it a name. That's basically how we handle we, we create a handle to that to a, to a particular state. Uh, and uh, using the idea of adding lifecycle to states, uh, Mount just adds a little bit more to that API. It just adds a start and stop functions. Those can be values, those can be functions, those can be anything you want, but this is basically uh, the API for Mount. So looking at this, we define a state, giving it a name, and uh, we say this is how it starts and this is how it stops. And at this point, you already, if you understand this, this, this is pretty much what Mount is. This is, there's a lot, there's some, some other things that I'll, I'll show you, but uh, uh, there's no ceremony. This is it, right? So every, 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 everything else just works with it as you would work with, var, with a value, with a var, with a function. 
Um, but of course, there's there's one more thing, right? So usually in the real world application, we don't just have a single state, right? We have many states, and uh, states are st states are beings that like to depend on each other, right? And uh, say let's say we have a config state. So here I have a state that uh, loads configuration from say some file system path, and I call and I named it config, and I said when you start. When I call mon start, and I'll show you that in a second, uh, please go to the file system, load that configuration, and uh, bind it to the name config. And usually, the way our applications go, we have um, we have configuration that many other uh, states or components or modules of your program use, right? So let's say we have a database or database connection state that uh, starts by connecting to the database. And, and, and stops by disconnecting from the database. On start, you can notice that it takes the same config, right? So it actually depends. We can, we can say that it, it depends on that config. And there are many, many of course, many dependency injection framework or inversion of control frameworks and libraries that allow, it, allow us to do that throughout the you know, software development history and, and enterprise development history. Uh, but I, I, I believe that the best dependency injection tool that we have in Clojure is compiler. Because compiler always knows that uh, when, when I get to DB, when I need to, you know, when I need to create that DB, if I don't have that config, I cannot do that. So I'll go, I'll go back to that config and, and I'll create that first. And uh, by, and Mount just uses that, that Intel, Mount just uses the knowledge of, of that give, that's given to it by compiler. And, uh, and, and, and it becomes just closure. So in order to use that config, there's nothing specific needs to be done, nothing outside of closure that needs to be done. You just require it from the namespace where this config lives in, and you can use it with this, uh, within this database state. Um, so this is, this is uh, I think this is a very neat idea. It, it has, it gives you very nice uh, properties to follow the compiler. For, so for example, when you call mount start, we can, uh, uh, Mount already knows how to start those states. What Mount knows the order that the states need to be started. So, for example, config is started first. You can see, and the database connection is started second. And and uh, Mount will return you the vector of states in the order they were started, right? And th and that's how the, you you start uh, those states, right? That's how you 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 say Mount start and it will start those states. The same way, of course, the works in reverse. If you call Mount start your resources, your states will be stopped. And you can see that configuration config is not stopped just, just because I chose it not to do so, just to demonstrate that stop is really optional. In this case, uh, for example, when you call mount start a second time, the config will be reloaded again, right? You can, of course, add a stop function. It's up, it depends on the use case. But this, this, is, this is pretty much how you work with mount. You define states and then you call mount start and mount stop. And there is, uh, it's a no-brainer to to use at least for for my use cases, and I hope for yours as well. So now let's uh, go to this namespace recompilation issue. When we when uh, when Mount sees a namespace being recompiled that has a dev state in it, what it'll do by default, it will uh, stop the state uh, before the namespace gets, gets recompiled, or if, if you will, on the namespace recompile, and it'll uh, start a new one. Right? It'll, it'll create a new one. And it'll start a new one. So you can see, Mount won't won't keep it a secret, right? So we'll have uh, it'll tell you that it's stopping database connection in this case and starting again. again. So in this case, this dev state can't lives in a namespace uh, db dot closure uh, or new dot db dot closure that we just recompiled. Uh, of course, this is a default, right? So my, maybe you you may not want to uh, restart those states every time. And I'll get to testing a little, a little later. Uh, of course, we have uh, this is a default. So we, the other things we can do is uh, the other desires to me we may have. We say I don't want my states to re re uh, restart on recompile. Uh, I'd like them to stop, right? I'd like to stop and create a fresh one and don't do anything with it. I'll start it myself, which is fine. Uh, or you'd you'd like to do nothing about it. Say in a closure script, which I'll talk about, uh, which I'll talk about a little later. Uh, for example, you ship the whole, you, the use case may be shipping the whole JavaScript to the browser every time. So it's okay to have a stale state because it's no longer stale in, in, in the eyes of the browser. 
more than pager loads and so forth. So this is basically, these are some options to, to deal with the state, with the namespace reload or recompilation. Uh, I'll, I'll go I'll go into this uh, example application a little later if I have time. So I'll, I'll have my REPL open, fired up. I'll show you the live example. Um, but I'll, 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 I'd like to switch to testing because somebody and I see that somebody actually asks about asked about testing. Uh, so let's let's pretend that we have this. Uh, uh, we disrupt the text messaging universe and we created our Uber app application that takes HTTP requests, converts them to text messages and send those text messages. And it will have three uh, three states. It'll have web server, it'll have config, and it'll have uh, a send SMS state that can actually send those those messages. We'll use Twilio library, which, which is a great library for sending text messages. And uh, first let's see how uh, how the state is created. So we have this send, and I'll, I'll just focus on the send SMS state. And uh, so in order to create it, we just say, uh, and, and you can see that it, it becomes a function after it created. But in order to create it, we say we give to Twilio a certain authentication information, and uh, from config, if if you can if you can notice, and uh, basically we wrap it we wrap it in a, in a function that will later take the from phone number to phone number and the message itself. So once the state is created, we can use this of, uh, as a function. We, we can just give it a from number to number and the, and the message body. Well, it's all it's all good, right? It'll work. But what happens if we run our test suites? So if we uh, let's say we have you know we run them like hundred times a day, it wouldn't be would be very great to send real text messages to real people hundred times a day for no good reason, right? So uh, would it be probably interesting or would be useful to swap that state within the application to something. Um, simpler, something that doesn't have any side effects, for example, or any external side effects. And we can do that. We can say, we can create a function that takes an SMS, takes a text message, and just puts it on core async channel, for example. And we uh, and uh, we can tell mount, using uh, start with API, we can tell mount to substitute it as it starts the application. We mount, The application will no longer know about the real send SMS state that we created before in the slide before it'll just use that function instead and uh, the start with takes a map right so map where where names are basically state names and the values are um and the values are uh, and, and the values are values right like they can function they can be anything else the reason you can see the full fully qualified namespace name for a state here it's really just uh a way to this doesn't go and find the actual var. This is just the way that mount remembers them. So this is just a string. If you we can pass a string as well, it'll work as uh, it'll work as well. Um, and uh, later on within the test, you can you can definitely you know in, you can definitely go to the uh, core async channel, get the SMS message. In the same way you write we write all other tests. We like we like our state bound, locally bound, and we like to work with values. And we like to have as le as least number of side effects as possible. So this was this is this allows us to do that. And again, you can pass as many states as you want with as many values with a single API. Uh, besides swapping alternate implementations and uh, figuring out how to stop and start application by using Closure Compiler, there there are a couple of things, couple couple other things that I'm not going to go over right now. But I just want you to maybe you can look into the documentation if you if you're interested. To see how they work, but you can start and stop parts of the application, which uh, which is of course great for testing, but also saved me a couple times in production when I when I needed to take something out of rotation and I would log it in, I would I would log into the network REPL and I would just stop queue listeners, which would still have application running, but uh, but they would not take any events, so they would it wouldn't any, it wouldn't do. Any, any any damage really, and once in this case the load balancer had a problem. So once they changed the load balancer, I just brought application in the rotation by simply enabling those two states to to queue listeners. Some something something interesting to consider. Uh, you can start an application without certain states. You can stop an application except certain states. That may be useful when you work, for example, with the web application, but. Um, you don't want to restart a web server, right? You like to re restart uh, everything, everything else, but the web server because it binds to the port and takes you know a couple seconds to unbound. It's just just a useful thing to do. Usually in development, it's mo mostly useful in development. So now I'm gonna, I would, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and um, 
I uh, would like to talk about Closure script. So I originally wrote mount for Closure uh, because that's where I had problem with the state management. And uh, several people approached me asking if, it gonna, if it's going to work in Closure script and what, is, what does it take to make it work there. The f first, I, I didn't understand. I didn't really know if there is a need, if there is such a such a need in Closure script, because I'm mostly focused on Closure. Uh, at work, and I do a little bit of ClojureScript, but I'm not a ClojureScript guru. So, uh, actually, uh, people who approached me, some of them actually shared their great ideas on how Mount can be uh, changed a little bit so it works for both Clojure and ClojureScript. And uh, I'd like to, pre and I, first of all, I'm really grateful to, to those ideas, and uh, I'll show you um, how how Mount works with ClojureScript and what what were the challenges. So the first challenge, of course, is uh, is naming Clojure namespace API. When I uh, when I start looking at Clojure script, I decided to do something trivial that that doesn't really affect core functionality of Mount, but it's just interesting to have. So I I, I thought, okay, okay, so we have those namespaces and vars, and and they depend on each other. Naturally, uh, what if I you know pull all the namespaces and I ask, hey, hey, a namespace, tell me what you depend on. Basically, the question is, what, what do you require, right? And I can pull all the namespaces. I can uh, basically filter all the namespaces by the states, by the mount states that I already have, and create this uh, this graph, right? This sort of visual representation. And then closure in closure namespace API, you can intern those namespaces. So in closure script, unfortunately, you cannot do that, and there is a good reason for it, right? The reason is that uh, when you compile closure script in advanced mode, uh, all the namespaces things things gets renamed, right? And and uh, the namespaces gets uh, intermingled, uh, and uh, basically it's the, this one huge, very efficient and optimized blob is produced, and you can no longer uh, intern the namespace at, at runtime. Uh, at least it's not it's not, at least not very easily. Uh, there are great improvements in ClojureScript Bootstrap, which basically evaluates ClojureScript at runtime as you give it ClojureScript at runtime. But I decided to for the for this exercise, I decided to stick to Clo to to native vanilla closure script. And uh, I decided, okay, so maybe this is not, maybe this is not the best approach to, uh, maybe the namespace, uh, the namespacing is not the best approach to rely on namespaces, is not the best approach in closure script. And uh, what we end up with, with the, uh, with, with with my ideas and, and and ideas from other people, which were really, really helpful, uh, we end up with something that's called a derefable state. And what it, what it is, it's basically the only change from the from the way that mount works in closure or works by default. Uh, the only change is now in order to use state, you just deref it, right? You put the deref sign in front of it, and that that's the only difference. There's no other difference. But uh, the derefable state in closure script mode, it, it, and I call it CLJC mode. Um, the the derefable state in the closure script mode is, um, or or in closure in the, in the CLJC mode is uh, is basically. Uh, the same var, same closure var, but uh, the, that var will never change again, because before we would, if we need to start or stop state, we would alter var root, right? Which is not very good for for uh, for things like. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about it later. But uh, in closure script, it's definitely it's definitely not easy because you 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 need to refer to that var at runtime, and it's not always possible by fully qualified namespace name, right? So, but in this case, the closure var. In this case, the closure var that doesn't change, and what, what changes just the derivable state inside inside of it. So think about it as as, as an atom, but uh, without anything else but being being able to deref. So this this is a derivable state. It just implements those two protocols and protocols in um, in closure and closure script. And, uh, and 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 this actually this is an interesting uh, point. So we mount mount does support a project with closure one point seven and later just because mount sources. Are uh, CLGC sources, and uh, I just decided that closure one point seven is a is a is a perfectly fine starting point. Uh, and of course, the the API, this this uh, derefable API, if you put the mount in um, in a, in the mount CLGC mode, this API is consistent across closure and closure script. Right, so it's not just it's not that you have to use mount in closure one way and use it in closure script another way. It's just a choice. If you use it in in, in this mode, it's, it's the API is consistent. Uh, and this approach has very nice uh, properties, as I 
as, a, as, as we developed it, we noticed it has a very nice property. So something that you deref is intuitively associated, and closure intuitively associated with a state behind it. And uh, another interesting side effect uh, is that system may start lazily without an explicit call to mount start. You can still call, call mount start, of course, of course, but uh, by default, if uh, if mount sees uh, deref state, it'll just start it if it's not started. So you can actually start parts of the system lazily while other part of the system will be dormant and not started if you don't need it at the moment or for, for this particular use case. States may now have watchers. Uh, this is just an idea at this point. I have not implemented anything, but uh, it's an interesting idea because we were talking about life cycle hooks and uh, different different use cases, but it's not there, it's just an idea. And of course, it plays nicely with direct linking as introduced in closure 1.8 because that var is, is not changing, right? So the var is, is can be statically bound and uh, statically statically linked, and uh, it's, it's still going to work fine. And again, API is consistent across closure and closure script. So now, as we covered some closure script, I'd like to show you that visualization that I talked to. They talked a little bit about the namespace in, in Poland namespace, which which is still possible on the closure side, and uh, you can see that uh, this is uh, kind of a little visual, a little ASCII visual, if you will. Uh, that shows you all the states, uh, their statuses, the orders they was they they would be started in or they were started in, and uh, their dependencies. The, the reason I didn't go and create a visual uh, thing for it yet is because it has one caveat, right? It, it's namespace based, so and mount doesn't really restrict you to have a single state in the namespace. You can have as many states in the namespace as you want. And if, if so, if it so happened that you have more than one namespace and one of them depends on each other within that namespace, this particular graph will not show you that because it's namespace based. So that's the only gotcha. Uh, that's the reason I kind of I still use it in in development, which is which is pretty useful for me in development. But I didn't go anywhere anywhere with it yet. So it needs still needs a little more thinking. But it's there for um, for visual for, for kind of getting a visual of your system. Um, so. One thing that, uh, and I, I'll talk about it in criticism and uh, in, in, in those Reddit, Reddit discussions that we had about mount is that uh, in mount, the one, one of the claim was that uh, since mount uh, keeps everything in, in, in namespace and wars, it's impossible to create multiple systems or mul multiple collections of those resources uh, uh, in the same runtime or in the same REPL and run them you know, run locally in the lead binding, so 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 to speak. So while I don't think uh, personally, I don't think that should be a core functionality of mount. I, I also don't think it's impossible. So I created yort, which is I think 30 or 40 lines on top of mount, uh, which basically what it does, it creates that system, right? It has the blueprint. It takes the intel that mount has, creates that system, and then detaches itself from vars or from anything from namespaces or f from anything you want. So basically, it, it, at the at the end, you have a system. That uh, that is local. You can have as many as you want, uh, and uh, you can. Work, the only thing that it knows besides uh, besides values for those states is how to stop them. So you can stop them later on as well. Uh, and of course, you can now run. You know, you can use it simultaneously in the same closure runtime with no 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 problems. You can go to your and check it out if that's the use case that you you're looking for. Uh, this, is, this was an interesting exercise just to prove that nothing. And closure is, you know, general purpose language. So closure var is not bad; they're good, and they can be used in in any way possible. So, so this is uh, this is your, uh, and it enables to run multiple systems simultaneously in same closure runtime and locally bound. So, some some to check out. Uh, so now now to the you know nitty gritty to the most interesting part of the talk. To the, to the criticism, and uh, I, I want to say right up front that uh, criticism is probably one of the best things uh, I, I usually get for my work, right? Because that enables me to think um, to think through. It. Criticism is usually usually has an interesting um, character. It has an interesting feature in it. That uh, it, it you usually it's it's either people with passion who criticize you cr criticize you or people with facts who criticize you and or, or people who care they would criticize you all this all three actually produce a nice um, 
a nice universe of people who who give you great ideas, right? So maybe 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 mount doesn't really work the way you know all the people and most of the people want it to work, or maybe there is uh, there's definitely room for improvement. So criticism was invaluable and still is invaluable for me to make the mount better. So and uh, of course we have uh, we had many ready discussions, uh, probably a month and a half worth of ready discussions that criticize mount. And the first uh, criticism that I that, that I that I hear uh, usually it's that uh, mount uses namespaces and vars versus something like records and protocols, right? To define to define states. While this criticism is a meta criticism for the next one, I'll show you. Uh, there's really the mount really is it doesn't really care what you uh, use as as, as uh, what you as developer use to create those to create in those states you can uh, so mount is orthogonal to the use of records uh, we can create you know uh, protocols and uh, and records that uh, extend those protocols and the mount will just use the life cycle mount will just use them and manage their life cycle and uh, I gave a, a real code example at the Reddit thread. You can, uh, I'll, I'll of course share the slide so you can go to that Reddit thread and see the code example that I uh, that I gave where I create protocols and records and use mount just to manage their life cycles. So while this criticism is uh, is valid, I mean, mount does use namespaces and vars. Uh, there is nothing stopping uh, anyone from using records and protocols while working with mount. The next one is uh, the next criticism is that state is singleton, right? So the, the previous criticism, namespace and vars versus records and protocols, is kind of like a meta criticism for this for this guy. So state is singleton, and singleton is usually associated with something negative, right? Singletons are are are, are bad, right? Singletons are, singletons are something that that kind of restrict us in the way that we can work with them, right? Because it's only one one of them, and. Uh, to this, to this criticism, I say that uh, if you have different resources, if you have a different resource, you create a different state, right? So we have, for, for example, we have, uh, you know, we have Redis and Hadoop. Uh, this will be two different states. And yes, Redis state will be singleton. Uh, but uh, if you do testing, right? If you, that's that's the kind of where, where this criticism usually leads up to. Yes, it's singleton, but what if I connect to, if I, what if I want to connect to my test database within the same, uh, using the same var? And I, I just showed you an example before how you can swap uh, the states while starting uh, while starting the application. So I truly believe that, uh, I mean, it's singleton, to say, say that singleton state is singleton and singleton are bad is, uh, is really saying nothing because state is singleton without any context means just doesn't, doesn't mean much, right? So if you give it a context, if you say that state is a resource and uh, state state as a resource is also managed, it has a life cycle, right? So if you if you add that context to this to the thought, then it doesn't doesn't uh, it becomes a little different. I mean, you're looking from a different angle, and I don't think that uh, for for your database connection with the same host, same username, same password, same uh, same schema. Same everything uh, to have a single state represented is such a, such a bad idea. I think it's a great idea actually because it doesn't have it doesn't have a confusion. Um, and uh, and the, this link uh, the link below shows you an app application uh, that uh, can swap uh, that, that with, with the example how to swap states. So the biggest I guess the biggest criticism the biggest point is. Uh, is that if you combine those two namespace and vars and singletons, that you cannot run multiple systems in the same JVM, and this would this would always come down to this. All, all the criticism that we had, all the discussions that we had, would always come down to this. So you have a system which is here. We, we define the system as a group of application resources, right? You cannot run multiple systems within the same JVM. And when I usually uh, ask why, why would you do that? Uh, the, the response I get is that I usually I run tests in the same REPL where I do development. While I don't do that, I really can dismiss that this is a proper way to do things and this is something good good to do in development. So I created Yort for for this very reason, just to show the first mount does not really restrict you not in, in doing that. And and second of all, you can use definitely you, you can use Yort if that's your workflow. But even if that's your workflow, I see nothing. I, mean, I, I see nothing wrong with the uh, with running 
with firing up a different REPL and just running tests there, running tests there, excuse me. So the it becomes actually a lot more decoupled in my in my mind and uh, cleaner. But again, this is just how I develop things and uh, I'm sure that we all develop a little differently and uh, we all have our reasons for that. So this is uh, this is the criticism that was, kind of, uh, and the link, link uh, above talks a little more about running multiple systems. Uh, link below, I'm sorry, on the very bottom of the slide, talks a little more about running multiple systems. <laughs> So I, I just like to point out that the mantra, the closure mantra stays with mount, right? We still prefer values and immutability. The mount doesn't take that away. We prefer functions and local bound state, which is still which still stays. We minimize the code that has access to resources. And this is also this is all something that we do as developers, right? This is not uh, any particular library or language or or anything. This is our choice, right? We have uh, when we write when we write software, we can write it. Uh, in any way possible, because it ends up doing zero and ones at the end, right? So we can we can do whatever we, we want. But the closure mantra usually usually is an immutability values function locally bound state, and the uh, mount does not prevent you to do to do that. And of course, uh, I, I when I develop application, I I always prefer balance, right? I, I I don't like to build formal systems, completely formal systems, but be, because that's what they are, they they're formal, and uh, I see a little limitation in that. Also, I like to you know, build very messy systems because, well, they're messy. I like to find uh, some middle ground, some golden middle that gives me the balance of formality or purity and pragmatism. So yes, with Mount, I believe that Mantra stays. I'd like to also talk about the Mount adoption. The Mount is quite young as, as a you know, library goes. It's uh, two, and a half, two and a half or three months old and uh, it was great to see it and uh, used in uh, Luminous, which is a closure micro, I would say micro platform that allows you to build web application, web, web applications with uh, with no sweat, basically pretty quickly. And the uh, Luminous manages uh, all the states with mount and has documentation, great documentation on that as well. And of course, the the, the book that uh, that's coming out right now, it's in beta. It's called Web Development with Closure. Second edition, I believe it. Uh, I haven't read it yet, but uh, I believe it features Mount as well as uh, some to manage state. And so I think it's a very great story, very compelling story for Mount. And uh, so far, this book had nothing but great reviews uh, for people who got the beta. We also have. Um, yep. Sorry to interrupt, but we've got a few minutes left. So I don't know if you'd rather finish with your slides or if you want to answer a few questions before we close up here. Okay, let, let me let me take thirty more seconds, and then I'll, yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll uh, just mention that adoption was nothing but great, and uh, I keep hearing a lot more people that that are excited about Mount, and uh, we we constantly chat and find you know find uh, solve problems and work on the ideas, and I think that balance between the these two worlds is something that uh, closure combines, or if we say composes. Uh, beautifully, and if we choose to, you know, if we choose to use both worlds, if we choose to accept both worlds and not to lean toward to, to the one side or another side, I think we, we get this great balance, and we can, you know, we can compose within that lambda. Also, I'd like to thank all the people, and I have, I'm sorry if I missed anyone. So this is the GitHub uh, suggesting me who 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 is who have, who, who contributes and uh, have discussions on Mount and. I'd like to thank all these people and more people to come because uh, without these ideas, I mean, Mount will be would, would just be would not be there. I would not be as as far as as, as it is right now. And I say let's let's talk. We have a Clojurians Mount Slack channel, and I welcome everyone to, especially with criticism and feed, any feedback you, you you guys may have. Now let me let me take um, let me take a quick look on questions. Okay, what are the problems? Ooh, okay, so I see two questions. Uh, uh, okay, with two, two comments. The first question is, uh, what are the problems with Mount? What criticism of Mount do you think are valid? Do you think... Um, Uh, and presentation did a great. Okay, so I I think I, I hope I answered that already. There the, the three biggest criticism is as as stated, singleton, 
and uh, using namespace and namespaces and vars versus protocols and uh, records and uh, be not able to run multiple uh, multiple system within the same JVM. Uh, the second question I see is uh, one thing I generally try to avoid is distributing state across many namespaces in the application. Is it possible to use mount to manage state but without defer, without defing state or by constraining all the def states to a single namespace? Sure, that's, that's definitely possible. Mount does not uh, restrict you to or does not uh, does not uh, require you to use uh, states in a single in in many different namespaces. You can definitely use a single namespace if you want to and put all your states there. Um, so there, there's no there's no restrictions there. Do we have well, any more questions? I think that's it. So if you'd like to wrap it up, then we. Okay, I'm wrapping it up. I really loved my journey so far. It's the three months journey, and I invite everyone to join me. Thank you.